Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm so excited because we have a very special guest. It's Dan Hegerson, and he is here today. He's an author, and he is part of our podcast community. He has his own podcast on our um, station. He is just amazing. He writes, he's been writing a sequel of books, and they are just amazing. And today, he's here to talk about The Commander, and he's going to tell you a little about the story and what's behind it and give you a little bit of tidbits about it so it gets you a little excited and and you know he has uh just a great way of expressing you know his stories and so listen to his uh his podcast because you're going to be amazed when you hear what he has to say so dan tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do and and tell everybody a little about your books and then we'll get right into the commander Okay. Well, um, I live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania with my wife, Cheryl, and we've been here since 1996. Um, I grew up in Sheridan, Wyoming, and I went to college, uh, University of Wyoming. And uh, my wife and I are what you would call lay ministers. And so we've taken ministry um, assignments around the country for many years. Uh We've been in Lancaster the longest because that's when our children started to grow up. And so we, we decided to put in roots here and we started an automobile business. We own, a, own and operate an automobile dealership, detail shop and body shop in Mannheim next to the big Mannheim auto auction. And uh, so I have a degree in journalism that I didn't use very much after I graduated from college, much to my father's dismay. And mm. so I started pursuing other interests including the ministry but also in cars and stuff but about 2016 i decided that i want to get back to writing because i just felt the pull and i've always want always wanted to write books uh i was trained as a journalist and back when i was going to school back in the 80s they trained journalists to write in the third person present tense Mm -hmm. And they said, my instructor, Dr. Dan Jones, he told us, he said, you want to put your reader of the newspaper or the magazine article right there in the moment with you. So yeah. it's like, he says, we got to compete against TV, you know, the TV news. So we want to, we want our readers to be feeling like they're seeing it as they read it. And so that's, right. that's the best method to do it. So that's, I thought, man, it's be a great way to read, uh, to write a book. Yeah. And uh, so I started writing in the, you know, the third person present tense, and it really works well for action adventure, which is my favorite genre, you know, action adventure, a little bit of romance put in there and stuff. But just it, it, it really works well, just it's, a, it's like watching a movie, I'm told. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so I wrote my first book back in 2016, 2017, it was called The Good Fight. And the reason I brought up my connection to Mannheim, PA is because it was all based on the business that goes on there in that area, which is all about the Mannheim auto auction. And what we do is we bring cars in from all over the country. We get them all shaped up nicely. And then we, then we put them through the wholesaling at the auction to, for dealers to sell to other dealers. Well, when I first got there, there was some, and I got opened up shop, there was some crime going on with some Russian uh, mafia people from New York. They were coming in and they were taking drugs and money and they were hiding it inside the panels of the cars and then selling it at the auction. They would have people already set up to buy the cars, outbid everybody, and then that car would be transported to wherever they wanted to go, whether in country, out of country. They were smuggling money and 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 smuggling drugs through the cars like that. Well, wow. that happened right next to my shop, <laughs> and I got I got interviewed by an FBI agent who was uh, you know investigating these people, and that story just kind of stuck with me. And then when I want and I thought, wow, this makes a great book. So I developed a family called the Edwards family, and they owned one of the biggest wholesaling, uh, detailing shop, body shop in the area. And I sh just developed a whole scenario how these Russians targeted their company, wanted to take it over, um, tried to kill some of them, and uh, how the daughter of the, uh, the granddaughter of the owner was the only one that was really left. And she had to fight these guys. She had to, you know, keep them from taking over her family business and killing her and stuff. And so that was, that was the good fight. And that developed into two more books, um, which was the cartel crusher 
and then the last enemy. And uh, it's all about this family and how they they had to fight this cartel guy, this Russian guy, and yeah. uh, get rid of him. And then the you know when I when I wrote those books, I ha I had developed so many different characters that people found so interesting. I started getting you know feedback from people that read the book saying, what about this guy? What about this girl? Like there was this one girl, her name was Marnie and she was somebody that I called the cartel crusher in the first book. Well, people want to know more about her. So right. she was a, a person that my main character, Jacob Edwards in the commander saved her life from being uh, raped and killed by a, uh, a pirate in the Caribbean down near Cosmo. Oh, wow. And she was the daughter of the president of Mexico. So she decides after that happens that she's going to abandon her luxurious life and she wants to go into the military and she wants to fight crime like Jacob Edwards did. And so she uh, goes into the military and she gets on the uh, Mexican task force against terrorism and cartels and she becomes the cartel crusher. And, you know, then I the people want to know about her. Then I then they 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 saw about Jacob's dad, Jim Edwards, who's the old guy in the first book. Yeah. And they want to know where, what all happened with him. And so I wrote a sequel called The Legend of Deputy Jim, where I showed how he got his start in my hometown, which is Sheridan, Wyoming, and how he had to fight a bunch of bikers to keep them from stealing his wife and killing his wife and kid. Wow. And I still got more questions about Jacob because people wanted to know more about Jacob, his beginning. So that brings us to commander which is the backstory of jacob edwards and he's the son of jim edwards who's the founder of edwards auto in Mannheim. and he but he went into the coast guard and he made a name for himself because he was uh he was a very capable guy but he had one thing that happened to him that kind of really badly affected his life when he was an ensign down in the caribbean um he was commanded by his captain to take a skiff over to an abandoned yacht yeah. down off the coast of Central America. And him and his partner came upon this really horrid scene where some pirates off the coast there had attacked this yacht and killed his family and, and raped some of the girls. And they found a little girl like, you know, nine, 10 years old in the main cabin who was barely alive. And he had to hold this girl and she died in his arms and it just it broke something in him and uh so that he's that's where i started developing the whole uh rage berserker mentality with some of my characters like you know some of these guys they get they get triggered and they just you know you got the fight or flight well it's all flight when it comes to all fight when it comes to a berserker and he would just go in and 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 have no reserve and and no care about his own safety and he would just tear tear the enemy to pieces and that was kind of a flaw in his character because uh, you know in the military you can't especially today's military, you can't really have that, especially among your officers. So yeah. it got him in trouble more times than not. But his competency and his, his, his brilliance of command and his ability to think coolly and stuff was also there. And so he was recruited by a special task force inside the military and law enforcement uh, by a guy named Captain, Tom, Captain Tommy Williams, who made him one of his operatives, um, that he would go out and he would take care of, you know, illegal smuggling of drugs or or human trafficking or something like that and he would he would command different um task force to do that on the meantime he gets he gets a promotion to commander and he becomes he gets put in charge of a hamilton class cutter which is one of the largest ships in the coast guard and so wow. his boss tommy who is a navy guy um uses that as an opportunity for him to take care of bigger jobs in the commander which is like I said, it's a prequel to the Last Enemy series. We I, I show the background of my my main um, bad guy, who's Boris, and he's a Russian mobster. And uh, so this is uh, Jacob's first confrontation with this guy's organization. And what he does is uh, Boris takes on a contract from a Saudi prince to cause some turmoil in the uh, the Gulf of Mexico in the oil industry. And what he wants to do is he wants to uh, 
stop the oil production down there, get get laws passed where they can't drill, where they can't produce oil down in the Gulf of Mexico. And so he does that by causing a big uh, oil accident, oil rig accident, where it's, you know, they want to get oil spilling out all over the place. And therefore, yeah. the, the United States government say, OK, no more drilling, no more nothing you can't do because we can't handle the pollution. Right. Um, so uh, his cutter, his his group, um, his command, they get wind of this and they stifle the whole thing wow. before it happens. So that's I'm not going to give you any more spoilers away, but that that's basically the plot of the book and everything he's got to go through. And and his commanding officer, who is a captain and a second commander down in Corpus Christi, Texas, gets uh, compromised by this this organization because he has a he has a bad addiction to uh painkillers and stuff and so they they use that against him and they try to use that to sway commander edwards into not confronting them and and so the whole book just goes back and forth with all that stuff but it's it, there's a lot of action a lot of adventure and of course with my books i put a lot of good fight scenes in there um yeah. with martial arts and stuff and i make commander edwards a very very uh skilled fighter and uh he has to fight some pretty formidable people in 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 the story and there you know he's a family man and there's a there's a real wonderful relationship between him and his now at this point in time nine-year-old daughter danielle who is one of the main characters of the of the first book i wrote which is the good fight um and it just shows how he's raising her and teaching her how to be a martial artist and all this kind of stuff and helping her with her ballet and it's just you know you got all that whole family thing going on there yeah. so it's it, it 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 won uh, some awards. It got a bronze medal from Reader's Favorite. It got some. Um, it placed with some other com places, and it's it's been on the, uh, the Amazon bestseller a couple of times. Number one Amazon bestseller a couple of times. So, it's it, it's a real fun book. I think people really would enjoy it. It'd be a great summer read, and yeah. um, you get it. At, you can get it on Barnes and Noble. You get it on Amazon. It's uh, digital, and it's also you know you get paperback or hardback. Oh, that's wonderful! Now, did your inspiration for all these books start when you when you had that issue with the Russian mafia, or was this something you always wanted to do, like it was inside of you? Well, the particular storyline obviously was with that that incident that happened. It just you know things would happen. I got. I guess I got a writer's mind, <laughs> so, so, so I I can just take a little incident like that and start thinking a whole story, yeah, through. And that's what I did. Um, another thing that really helps me is uh, you know listening to music, and you hear exp inspiring music, and and I start developing storylines along that. Like I think at the time I was developing the Good Fight, uh, Rachel Platten's song, uh, fight song came out. And so I applied that to my story and that helped me a lot with Danielle and her character. Yeah. You know, this is my fight song where she has to stand up and fight. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, before that, I, I'd come up with lots of different ideas about what to write, but that, that, that was strong enough to really sit down and start doing it, you know, just actually start pinning and typing and writing a book. And so I've you know, since 2016, I haven't stopped. I'm working on my 10th book now. So number nine is getting ready to be published and I'm working on number 10. Oh, wow. Can you tell us the title of number nine? Number nine is going to be Brandy Dame of the Caribbean. And it's a sequel to uh, Brandy Ballad of a Pirate Princess. Let me make sure I get this focused in for you. This is my most popular book, and we'll probably be talking about this on my next podcast with you. Mm -hmm. um, this one, you know, has definitely sold better than all my other books. I think people like the whole pirate concept. But uh, yeah. Brandy and her love interest in this book, John Edwards, are the, now I'm really giving a spoiler away, are the matriarch and patriarch of the whole Edwards family, and that's the bloodline that I'm writing about. So I've got from 1820s to, you know, the 2020s that I'm writing about this family and all the different things they go through, the, you know, all the different descendants. Uh, so Brandy Dame of the Caribbean happens 10 years after this book. And 
most people don't know what dame means, but in, in English culture, the dame is a female knight. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's a, it's a woman that's been knighted by, you know, the British monarch. Okay. And so this, that whole will show how Brandy gets to that point where she gets knighted. Yeah. And, uh, that, that one has a lot. And then that, the next book has a lot of martial arts in it because a lot of my friends from um, my old martial arts they asked right. me to put martial arts in my book and I have uh, friends like Bill Shaw who's a uh, Hollywood stunt man and uh, actor and stuff he's been in movies like Get Carter and he, he chore choreographed a lot of fight scenes for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies oh, back in the 80s and early 90s and he he's very good friends with Billy Zapka and has worked with him a couple of times um he asked he was my first martial art instructor and he said you need to put more fight scenes in your books i really like them and then uh one of his students a guy named troy miller who also is a uh hollywood stuntman now who's been in uh movies like get frankenstein worked with people you know uh steven seagal and others all over the industry he also told me to like put more fight scenes in my book and and because they just like the way i explain it because uh yeah. it's kind of the way sifu who bill shaw we call him sifu would explain how to put these moves together they said i do it the same way he did right <laughs> except for i put it in a story you know like yeah. sifu would say you take his arm you pull it out you take your other arm you put it under his armpit you pull it over you know and i just i just what I did is I explained the fight scenes the same way he would explain how to execute the move. And yeah. it seems like people really like that. I read one of your books and what I like about it is it's so detailed. Like, you know, you really, you could just, you could just close your eyes. Well, you're reading the book, but you could just imagine it in your head as you go along because you, you're very detailed in your writing where some people aren't always like that. You read, you know, fiction books and they, they tell the story, but they're not as detailed. But when you're a very detailed writer, you know, I was always taught to be a detailed writer. You can actually, you know, imagine the story. And then you could even, some, some people actually, they'll take the character and sometimes they'll, they'll put their own character in, you know, um, to make it more their story in their own head, you know, and, uh, and I, I find that very interesting. And when you wrote your books, did you leave like a cliffhanger on the other books? Like, do they have any relations or their own their individual stories? Or I really, I really try to write each book as a standalone story, but I have used cliffhangers to get people interested in reading a book. Like yeah. uh, at the end of the um, the good fight. Uh, Danielle is sitting in her office and Marnia and another gentleman come in and tell her that her uh, dad and mom and her grandmother are still alive and everybody thought they were dead. Oh, wow. And so, you know, then, then, then I go through, then the next book I wrote was The Cartel Crusher. And at the end of that book, I show how they survived to a point. But yeah. you don't really see the whole story until you get to the third book. So I, you know, I'm trying to get people to go to the next book, sure. But yeah. I do, I do get a lot of good comments um, from especially uh, reviewers, like uh, editorial reviewers, you know, professional reviewers yeah. that say that that my books are good standalone books that you right. could you could just read that and you could be satisfied with reading it. You don't have to read the first one in order to enjoy the second one or the third one, right? And, uh, so I try, um, but you know, there is some carryover where you got to, if you want to, if you want to know what happens with the story, you got to read the next book. Right. Right. Now do you, do your books, like, are you just writing them to entertain people or do you have like takeaways? Like, do you want someone to learn something or how, you know, get a, some type of takeaway from the story after they finish your book? I think that, um, you know, every writer has that a little bit in their writing DNA. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I think that people in, in today get a little too much of their moral and ethical views from their entertainment. Yeah. And it, it's kind of alarming, especially me as a minister. Um, yeah. I find that alarming that when I'm talking to someone who isn't necessarily, you know, a part of my group that I teach and stuff in that category that I could, you know, when I'm talking to them, it's like, it, it, it could come from an episode from Friends yeah. or, you know, uh, 
Justified or any other popular TV show that's out right now. They get their, you know, they're just parroting what they hear or, or what they read from the latest book or what they've seen on the latest movie. And I'm like, you know, and I thought some of these ethics I don't really agree with. Yeah, so yeah. I thought instead of being preachy about it, yeah, just put it in the in the narrative of the story, you right? Know, where you know that people just no, it's not uh, adultery is not a good thing. You know, it's 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 a bad thing. It hurts people, and instead of like you know making excuses for it, right? Show it. You know, right. <laughs> rape is not a good thing. I think everybody pretty much agrees with that. But, yeah. you know, um, illegal drug use is not a good thing. Right. You know? But yeah. you don't, without being overbearingly preachy about it, just, you know, do it in the story. And right. so, yeah, that that's, that's my takeaway. And I'm a Christian. And obviously I'm a Christian minister. So I have people praying in my, in my stories and acting on, certain scriptures and getting positive results yeah but i try very hard not to be preachy with it i just want to put it in the narrative yeah. of the story and i think some of my reviews that i've gotten like on amazon bear me out that i've, I've been successful with that or i don't you know come across overbearingly with it but they, there is a, a an underlying message of ethics and stuff yeah. like that in my writing i find that you know the best way to to teach people things or to get the message across is not to tell them this is the way it should be done is to like you're doing in your books. Basically, you know, you're, you're talking about an issue, but you're, you're not preaching about it. You know, you're just right, talking right. About generalization, you know, and I think when people get the feeling that you're not telling them that this is the way it needs to be done and you're just creating a narrative you know, I think people tend to like draw to it and really take thought, you know, and then, you know, sometimes people's, you know, decisions may change sometimes, you know, they may, their values may stay the same, but they, they take it in, in a positive way rather than, you know, being defensive and negative about it. Well, in fact, uh, like the whole berserker thing, I've, you know, in my, in my books, I've never really like uh, glorified that. Yeah. I've read up a lot about it, uh, you know, like military commanders that have had people that have had that kind of uh, aptitude in under their command in the middle of combat. And, yeah. you know, where they would just run out without any sense of self-preservation and take as many guys out as they can. That usually cause a heck of a lot more problems than it ever solved. Right. But, you know, from a Hey, this is really cool. I want to see this happen on on the screen. You know, people can really get taken in by that. So my book, you know, when I when I deal, with especially Jacob and his dad, who both had those tendencies, I, yeah. I show both sides of the coin. Well, yeah, it did work uh, in this little instance, but this is all the problems it caused for the guy because he did it. And right. then I'd show how when he kept his head. And kept and, and and kept his cool and thought things through and kept his emotions in check, he was 10 times more successful. So I'd show I'd show the flaw and then I'd try to show how they would work with that flaw to 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 overcome it. Right. And you know, it's yeah, I've I've just I've I've talked to a lot of uh, military people over the years, and and that's that's one thing that you just never want to have in like a like a sergeant of a of a troop. Never want to have that in your in your in your troop because it's yeah. just you get everybody killed. Oh yeah, for you get sure. a guy like that, a person like that that just goes berserk. Yeah, right. and so I know it's like a, a lot of the the Viking shows that are coming out today. Um, they they glorify that. Yeah. There's this raging maniac with two axes in his hand running into battle and just hacking everybody to pieces. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's not necessarily a good thing. No, it's not. It definitely is not. Now, when you created your books, like do you do you plan ahead on what you want to write? Or is it kind of on the whim where you get an idea and then you start focusing on that idea? And then once you've co created a book, you know, you might get some kind of urge or some kind of idea that pops in your head and you go with the next book. Or is it is it something that you've kind of planned? Because you've written a whole bunch of books, some of them sequels, some of them with cliffhangers. Have you been planning this like, you know, like these all these stories? 
Um, yes and no. Uh, when I wrote The Good Fight, that's the only thing I had in my mind was The Good Fight. Uh, I, I got to know the ending of my story before I start. That okay. I think I've said that to you before. Yeah. That I know. I know my endings. Um, you know, I, I, I know my endings and I work towards it. And so everything in the book works towards that ending. So I think, yeah. and I think I've seen that in, in, like, again, in reviews where people have noticed that, you know, that everything gets tied together. That's because I already know what the ending is. You know? right. So everything, yeah. everything I'm writing about is going towards that. And that's how I write. And I know other people that write differently. I was just talking to an editor a couple of days ago that told me that he had a guy that starts with the ending and writes backwards. Right. And I, I could never do that. You know, yeah. I, I, I know the ending, but I'm not going to write backwards. I'm just going to I know the ending and I'm going to build the story towards it. And I think with me, um, the sequels and the prequels and all that come in as I'm writing the book. And I'm like, oh, this this person right here, you could really uh, take this character farther. But like, I can't do it here in this story or it'd be too much. Yeah. You know, but uh, I, this, this this person has a story behind their actions that would really be cool to take Extent. a little bit farther yeah yeah so that 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 happens like my 10th book um which is i'm um, tentatively calling it the railroad man is about brandy's son arthur and mm -hmm. uh you know he's uh I, I i tell him brandy and in uh dame of the caribbean that when he gets old enough he runs away and joins the union forces during the civil war as yeah. you know an officer in the navy so uh the character i'm developing with him is he after after the war's over he joins the uh the railroad and he gets he starts working for the uh the i think the northern pacific is what we call it. yeah northern the, the one railroad the one clinic completely across the united states and then start branching up north and he gets sent to wyoming to coordinate the uh, northern expansion of the railroad which is later on called northern pacific and the whole drama that ensues there with uh dealing with all the indian nations going to the upper part of wyoming where you had the crow nation and all that and getting all the permits and the permission to build through those places and what they yeah. had to do um for that nation or to build through that and so that's 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 that story and see because everybody knows that deputy jim happened in sheridan wyoming in 1974 but how did how did jim and his family get there well from brandy so that's what i'm doing with uh arthur yeah the son so you're gonna have you know you're gonna have an indian basically an indian princess she's uh she's the granddaughter of chief pretty eagle who was a very famous crow um indian uh chief back in the 1870s who supported the united states when we fought sitting bull and all those other chiefs um during custer's last stand and all that yeah so just tying all that stuff in but uh, yeah. Yeah, he's going to fall in love with her and marry her and continue the Edwards line. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Does it take you a, a long time to complete each book? Like some people, you know, um, you know, they, they get really involved because I know that you have a business of your own and everything. Like, you know, is there a specific time that you just put aside? Because I, I know there's so many people out there that want to write a fiction book. So for you, you know, you know, having a business and, and having a family, like, do you square away a certain amount of time or are you just like you have an idea and you just keep going with it? Like, you know, how do you, you know, Know, organize everything i'm a morning person um so i get up pretty early and um but i do most of my writing at the shop and this is how i do it i go to the shop i have two managers i usually get there before either one of them my recon shop manager and my my uh body shop manager i get there and i'll open the whole place up get everything set in motion and all that and then i'll go and i'll just hide in my office for about an hour and a half and I'll write. And that's where I get the majority of my writing done. And then as the day goes on, I'm handling all kinds of other responsibilities. And, uh, you know, I come home and I got church responsibilities and family responsibilities. Sometimes at night, I'll have a little time to, to write. But basically, you know, Monday through Friday, that hour, hour and a half in the morning is really when I get a lot of writing done. And wow. it seems when I get 
really into it and I'm on a roll, all of a sudden I'm finding more time to write, you know, like I'll, instead of watching a show, I'll go in my office at home and, and finish yeah. that scene out that I was writing or, you know, it just depends. Like right now I'm, I've been really slow. I mean, I'm, I'm been on a meticulous section where, you know, I got one little chapter I've been on for the last week and a half. And yeah. I've, I learned not, I've learned not to beat myself up about that. It just, right. I'll figure it out when I figure it out, but it's got, it's got to be right. So I just write it and, and, and then in the back of my mind, I know, yeah, some editor's just going to tear this up anyway and change. <laughs> Not really. You, know, you got, I, I love my editors. My editors are wonderful. They really help me, but you know, I do the best I can and, and they just make it look better. Right. That, right. That, that's how I do it. You know, in the morning is, and that, that's my block of time. Some people want to stay up till two o'clock in the morning. I'm not that guy. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do that. I, I uh, by 10 o'clock, I'm ready to go to bed. Right. So for people who are just really um, eager to want to write a fiction book, do you have advice for them, like how they can get started or anything that, you know, could help them? I think that um, the biggest thing that holds people back from writing is not writing. I mean, I know I know that sounds simple, but uh, for me, it was just that. I just didn't sit down and start writing. Um, yeah. You know, when I was in college, I struggled with grammar and the basics. I did. And I, I took extra classes just to just to hone up on that stuff. And by the time 20 and that was back in the 80s. So by the yeah. time 2016 rolls around, I, I was out of practice. Yeah, you know, I was like, my 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 whole uh technique wasn't what it was wasn't what it was when I graduated from college for sure even though I had more ideas and I was a lot more mature um yeah but I just got to get rid of all those excuses I just sat down and I wrote and yeah. I wrote that whole book you asked me how long it takes me to write a book I can usually get one done in six months mm -hmm. yeah if I stay steady to it so I wrote that whole book and to this day my, my daughter she's a um she's an She's got a, a degree in English and a degree in um, political science, and she's an ABC Six uh, reporter in Philadelphia. So she she edited my first three or four books, maybe even more than that. Maybe she, yeah, you know, she read, she edited all my first seven books because she edited all the way up to Brandy was the first line editor, and um, her and my wife both said they said it, it it's like you wrote a whole book in one paragraph. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't put any breaks in it and my daughter you know the she, she she took my manuscript when i was done i had printed it all out because my first one and she took it to work with her every day and she edited it for as a christmas present behind my back oh that's so nice yeah it was really cool when they gave it to me but uh when they all got done, my wife, my daughter says, she says, Dad, I know you know how to break into paragraphs and I know you know how to break subjects down. Why didn't you? And I go, I was too interested in writing the story. And, you know, if I would have, if I would have went over it before you stole the manuscript from me, I probably would have did that. But said, thanks for doing <laughs> it. For me. But that's the way I wrote it. And, and it didn't, and I, I was so interested in writing the story that I, I didn't care about the details. And later yeah. on, I found out that that's the way most writers you know, your first draft is just you telling yourself the story. Yeah. You know, so don't worry about technique. Don't worry about being perfect. You know, right. until you give it to somebody else, nobody's going to nobody's going to know what you wrote or how you yeah. wrote it or how many words you misspelled or how many, uh, yeah. you know, things you did wrong grammatically. Yes. You can fix all that. And there right. are programs you can get like pro writing or autocrit or different things that can help you edit self-edit your your own work just just doing a reread through and you'll 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 fix things yeah so i think that's the biggest thing you know somebody just wants to write and i've told this to people many times it's just start writing yeah you know i mean just just get, get yourself i don't i don't know how your head works i mean there there i guess you can go look up formulas like if you're a real detailed person and you need a format where you got the beginning middle and end and every little detail if you're that kind of person, then do it and write a format. If that right. helps you, to me, that drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know what the end is. I know where I want to get and stuff. And I could, I could, I could do a very loose format. But I mean, if it was the more detailed it got, the more I'd be like, "Now this, this is too constrictive for me." But other people are, 
they flourish like that. Yeah. So that's another thing. You just got to figure yourself out. Yeah. Right. It's, if you just, if you just like uh, do it as it comes, fine. But the thing is, it's just get your fingers typing, you know, just yeah. start, start writing. Right. I mean, look at no. it and fix it. Right. And, you know, and the more you look at it, I think the more you find little tidbits and, and you get, you know, it gets better and better and better. You know, I, you know, it's, a, it's sometimes it takes like maybe 12 readings before you get it right, you know, um, but the more you, the more you look it over, the more you practice, you know, the better it gets, you know, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you, editors are wonderful. Yes, they are. I think everyone should have an editor. I think, you know, oh, everyone should definitely. invest in an editor for, for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, if you yeah, had to take- they're not your enemy, they're your friend. <laughs> no, they're not your enemy. They're definitely your friend. They are 100% yeah. friend. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had to take everything we talked about today, what are some of the things you'd really like to emphasize, whether it be on the commander or any, any of the stories that you told us previously that you wrote? What are some things that you, you'd like people to focus on? I know today you really wanted to talk to people about the commander and get that, that book across. You know, is there anything, you know, that you'd like to emphasize about that book? I think the commander, the biggest thing that it, it really glorifies um, the Coast Guard. My son is a Coast Guard officer and uh, he's uh, he's down in Wilmington, North Carolina. He's just getting ready to be promoted to lieutenant commander. Um, oh, April, I mean, not April, I'm talking about July 1st. So we're all going to be there for that. We're, we're heading out Saturday. And um I think that the Coast Guard is is you know, people don't understand how much those those people do for us yes. on a daily basis. I mean, it's the smallest of the armed forces. It's mm -hmm. the least funded, but it's also the most diversified. If you look at how small they are and everything they do. Yes. And they're and you know what? They're the only um, military force that has police powers inside the United States. Right. So they they you know they kind of wear a double hat they're yeah. there to guard us from um they're to, to guard us from foreign attack on our coast sure but right. they also have these responsibilities of you know keeping drugs from being smuggling and they're very 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 active in the human trafficking um you know uh enforcing making sure that doesn't happen they're the ones that are out there doing it more and more than any other of the uh, law enforcement agencies especially on right. the high seats so wow. i i think the commander really honestly shows just how great the coast guard is that's what i think and I think people really, uh, and I know the Coast Guard people that read the book, they really love it. In fact, yeah. I dedicated it to my son um, uh, when I wrote it a couple of years ago. And he was, I think he was just a junior lieutenant when I wrote it. But uh, yeah, and if the takeaway from that, from the commander is just, we got a great set of people out there in the Coast Guard. And, you know, their, their, their primary responsibility is to save lives. Yes. I mean. They're not, they're not, yeah, they're warriors. They are warriors, but they're not primarily warriors. They're, they're out there to guard lives and they're, yeah. they're, they're really, they really do a great job. All of them. They do. They really yeah. do. I think we need to give them more credit and we need to do more for them because I, I had this conversation when I was on a podcast just before I spoke with you and, you know, it, they, they do so much and they risk so much. And, mm -hmm. you know, us as, as Americans, we need to really do more for these men and women who who risk their lives every day to protect us 100 yeah. percent. yeah so that's that that would be my big spiel for today is the coast guard is just a fantastic organization and boy you know for as little as they are they really get a lot done <laughs> they're 100%. hard workers <laughs> they are hard workers, definitely yeah. now where can people find your books um you can find them on amazon Barnes and Noble, all of them. Uh, they're uh, on Nook and Kindle. Three of them are in um, audio now. Uh, the Good Fight, The Cartel Crusher, and Brandy Ballad of a Pirate Princess. So, oh, great. so those three are in audio. Um, you can find them on my website, which is danehendrickson.com. 
And that's just the way it sounds. It spells just my name, Dan, then E, then Hendrickson.com. And it'll take you right to my website. And if you go to my website, you can see, uh, you can see these podcasts. Um, uh, got them all uploaded on there and, uh, you can see, uh, all my books and the awards that they've won and the different, you know, honors that they've gotten over the years. And you can see explanations plus some of the really nice, um, reviews that they've gotten from different sources like Kirkus and readers favorite and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can also order books off of there. If you want to, uh, if you want an autograph copy, uh, you order it off that website, I'll send you an autograph copy and, uh, stuff like that. That's where you can find them. Oh, that's wonderful. You know, I, I really appreciate everything you've done. You know, I, I love, I love how you write. I love, you know, the stories, they, they sound amazing. I haven't read all of them yet, but you know, each one is just sounds really great. I it just, you know, it, it's, I like action. So, you know, mm -hmm. books like this, you know, grasp my attention and uh, you know, I, I commend you for everything you do. And, and Thank I you. really, it's, it's not, you know, people don't realize it's not an easy task to write a book. It's a lot of work and it, it's, it's a lot of energy that goes into it. And, you know, so for you to write all those books, uh, I, I really, you know, commend you for all your efforts because it, it takes a, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of time to complete those books. And you've done so well, you've gotten so many awards and um, I really, you know, I really enjoyed your, your book that I read and uh, I really, you know, I just want to say, you know, thank you because you, you, you've, you, you've, it's, it's kind of like you've taken li li live events, you know, and you've kind of turned them into fictional characters and in fictional scenes. And it makes it really interesting because people can relate because things like this are going on in our world, you know, which makes it even, even better, you know. So I just want to say thank you for everything you do. Definitely. Thank you, Stacy, for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun doing these podcasts. Yeah, and I, I love having you on, and I love hearing more about your your books and the stories behind it, and all the synopsis is behind it. And I look forward for you know to you know reading your books, and I I'm very excited about the new books that are coming out soon. So congratulations on that too. Thank you. Well, you know, you have a great day and I, you know, I look forward to seeing you soon. And is there anything else that you'd like to share before you go? We just have a great safe summer and fun. All right. And uh, God bless. Thanks. You're very welcome. You have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.